Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. It is my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, you all to this uh, uh, journal club uh, brought to you by the International Academy for uh, Clinical Hematology. Uh, I'm sure most of you are now well familiar with the journal club structure. This is our uh, gathering every twice per month, actually. So the scientific committee will select a peer-reviewed uh, article. And by the way, you are most welcome to send your suggestions for articles to be discussed. And then we'll ask the senior or the first author of the article to be a panelist and we'll invite an external expert who did not contribute to this uh, article. So the uh, journal club of the ICH is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Takeda uh, Oncology. And for the purpose of the uh, today's journal club, this is the article that was selected. This has been uh, recently published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And you can read the title, ROC2 inhibition with belumosidil. So you have to learn how to pronounce it for the treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. And actually, uh, I'm sure most of you are uh, quite familiar with the burden of uh, refractory and hard to treat chronic DVHD and its impact on the quality of life of patient after allogenic stem cell transplantation. So here, the uh, authors tested uh, a totally novel uh, drug uh, in a uh, heavily pretreated uh, population uh, suffering from chronic GVHD. And this novel drug has a quite, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, attractive, uh, exciting mechanism of action. And actually they have uh, treated 50 poor, 54 patients who had received one to three prior lines of therapy. So a highly advanced patient. And uh, to make a long story short, as usual, uh, they could see an overall response rate around 65%. Two thirds of the patient are going to respond. And when you look to the uh, complete remission response, again, very decent response rate. And they have tested different dosages but also they have analyzed the results depending on the number of lines of therapy received by the patient, depending on the severity, number of organs involved, the refractoriness status. And as you can see, all of these results are in favor of uh, this novel uh, drug, uh, belumosidil. And when you look to the duration of response probability, uh, the uh, time to next therapy probability, the uh, overall survival rate, and all of this is shown here, actually, these are extremely promising data for such uh, severe and heavily uh, pretreated chronic GVHD population. So that was my summary uh, of uh, this paper, and in order to uh, discuss this article as part of this journal club, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Alexander Lazarian from the Moffitt uh, Cancer Institute, who is actually the corresponding uh, and lead author of uh, this uh, collaborative work. But also uh, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Professor Bipin Savani from the Vanderbilt uh, uh, Institute in Nashville. Uh, I think uh, uh, Bipin is uh, well known to be a top expert in the field of long-term complications of after allotransplant and GVHD. So Alexander, Bipin, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your invitation, you, it's a pleasure. Okay, so uh, the first question I'll direct it if you allow me, Alexander, to Bipin. And I would like to ask you, Bipin, uh, maybe to set the stage why this topic of uh, severe or advanced chronic GVHD is extremely important 
and why we thought until recently it is a highly unmet medical need that deserves innovation and introduction of new drugs. Yes, thank you, Professor Bhatti. So before I mention ideal, you know, to my mind, ideal intervention to treat chronic GVHD, but let me briefly mention pathobiology, pathophysiology of GVHD. Here it's a very complex. It involves B cell, both B cell and T cell, and germinal center may play a pivotal role in the setting of immun immunological millennium of chronic GVHD. You know, pathophysiology of chronic GVHD can be separated into three phases. Early inflammation because of tissue injury, dysregulated adaptive immune system, and chronic inflammation and aberrant tissue repair with fibrosis. Now, pathophysiology and clinical phenotype of chronic GVHD reflects both immune and fibrotic component. Immune component, predominantly we use steroid immunosuppressive therapy. Fibrotic component, we also treat with immunosuppression, more predominantly steroid. But the ideal intervention would be target both aspects. Fibrotic chronic GVHD manifestation, including like fasciitis, very, very difficult to treat GVHD, ocular fibrosis, cutaneous sclerosis, and BO, uh, bronchitis oblique trans syndrome, are notorious and difficult to treat. So, what is our intervention right now? To, you know, we do have one FDA approved uh, ibrutinib, but steroid, more immunosuppression. And we have now you know, what is the detrimental effect of all those immunosuppressive therapy is late complication, quality of life. We have now 500 page book on late complication, all done, mostly done by the immunosuppressive therapy. So we have to have a something which does not give us late complication and also decrease the risk of infection when we treat GVHD. But effective against this fibrotic difficult to treat chronic GVHD manifestation. Thank you very much, uh, Bipin, for uh, really setting the stage and highlighting the importance of this topic. And by the way, I would like to remind our uh, audience and all the colleagues that you can uh, send your questions, your suggestions, your comments, and participate uh, directly to this journal club. You can use the chat box or the Q&A, and I'll do my best to share uh, your comments and questions with our panelists. So now my question is to you, Alexander, if you can give us a sort of a, a briefing or summary uh, about this new drug, its mechanism of action, and why you thought it is an attractive option to be tested. Because, I mean, as it has been already highlighted, uh, I think this field has been really uh, a source of frustration to all of us for many, uh, many years. So uh, what is it about when it comes to bel belumozidil? I'm, I'm going to right. well, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it was actually recently uh, renamed because uh, the initial uh, name that uh, the publications were uh, put together about is KD025. And I totally resonate to what Bipin has mentioned earlier about the pathophysiology of chronic graft versus host disease because uh, for the past few years, there have been a lot of insights uh, that uh, uh, have been made and a lot of uh, knowledge that's been gained in this area, exactly as Bipin mentioned, uh, with both B cells and T cells contributing to the pathogenesis of chronic GVHD, which is currently actually recognized as uh, TH17 and TC17 and T follicular helper cell mediated disease. Uh, what we also learned is that there is a concurrent deficiency in T regulatory T cells that also contribute to profound immune dysregulation that we observe in chronic GVHD. So what's really happening is their overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-17 and TH17, TC17 lineage uh, with overproduction of IL-21 by T follicular helper cells. And all this has been linked to aberrant activation to the STAT3 pathway, which is an inflammatory pathway and important component of chronic GVHD pathogenesis. 
So what uh, raw associated coiled coil kinase two is doing, in other words, ROC2, it's basically a protein kinase that is dysregulated in many chronic diseases, including chronic graft versus host disease. And the preclinical work done mostly in Bruce Blazer's uh, lab uh, really did demonstrate that ROC2 activation uh, was found to be associated with upregulation of that three phosphorylation and downstream overproduction of IL-17 and IL-21. At the same time, uh, what's happening, there's a downregulation of a tolerogenic STAT5 pathway that involves T-Rex. So what KD025 or Bilamazodil has been doing, it's selectively inhibiting ROG2 and uh, certainly has been put in the development uh, uh, through the clinical trials uh, to uh, fight against inflammatory, but more so uh, uh, similarly important fibrotic complications of coronary graft versus host disease. Uh, because the blockade of ROC2 has been also associated to modify fibrotic changes, which is the end product of chronic graft versus host disease. And KD025 can certainly downregulate uh, uh, fibroblast production and uh, diminish ultimately uh, sclerotic manifestations of chronic GBHD. And animal models, in fact, did demonstrate that uh, in the context of sclerotic model, uh, but also in the context of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. And those are early experiments that were done in Bruce, Bruce Blazer's lab back at the University of Minnesota uh, when I was there as a faculty. And, and certainly all these uh, preclinical studies, uh, they provided very strong rationale uh, for us to test this drug in the clinical setting um, uh, for the first time. And this was uh, the KD025-208 trial um, that was testing three dosing regimens of the drug. And one more thing just to mention before we move on, uh, the interesting fact was that in the preclinical experiment, uh, there was uh, no uh, inhibition of antiviral immunity, which is certainly an important consent, a con con concern that we've got, uh, and the uh, responses to CMV were unaffected. Excellent. So in summary, it can decrease inflammation, it can uh, decrease fibrosis, and uh, it can restore the immune homeostasis. So all, we're looking to all of this in chronic GVHD. So wonderful candidate. So uh, inhibiting ROC2 is definitely uh, something of interest. So Bipin, uh, when you saw these results, did you feel that uh, uh, the, uh, the drug rocked it? How, how, what was your feeling uh, about the results, the response rate, the duration of response, the time to response? As an expert, would you consider these are really attractive results? And w w what are the, I would say, uh, the positive and maybe negative aspects you have noticed in these results? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. So let me clarify first thing. You know, this drug at KDO25 or Belumosodil is produced by the Cadmon, and I don't have stock in the Cadmon pharmaceutical. No conflict. I don't of interest. have stock. I don't have stock in ibrutinib and insight uh, uh, Jacopy also. So, you know, when I saw this paper, you know, we were part of this clinical trial when it was uh, under clinical in the trial in 2016 to 18. But I compared this drug with which what we have approved drug, ibrutinib, and other drug which is most likely to be approved, rich 3 data was recently presented at the ASH meeting by our friend, Dr. Professor Gister. So let's, this is how I start, patient population. If you look at this study, almost 78% of patients had a severe chronic GVHD. Almost 80, 70% patients had more than four organ involvement. And many patients with a fibrotic type of GVHD, bronchiolitis, obliterans, and so on and so on. So this is the population. Now look at the population of ibrutinib. You know, I'm going to select which drug. If let's say I have a choice to select one of these three drugs and all three are approved by the FDA. So looking at the F, uh, ibrutinib population, you know, 88, almost 90% of patients had two organ involvement, but it mostly mouth and skin, 85%. I don't see much of those fibrotic we see in Bellumisodil population. And same thing in the, uh, JAKA figure, which is a totally different study, randomized study, which I can briefly mention later. But the most taking part for me here was the response for achieved across all six key subgroup with overall response 65% in the range with severe chronic GVHD, that's very good. 66% in patients with more than two organ involvement with prior failure to regimen 
and 70% response rate in patients with four or more organ involved. And the important part is, you know, that uh, when you're talking about giving any drug to any patient, you're talking about how long patient can continue. So more than almost one third of patient went on Bellumus ordeal for at 18 months. That means patients are tolerating well, no major infectious complication, and there was no major toxicity, which leads to, we need to stop this. And compared with uh, uh, ebrutinib, you know, about 25% of patients had to stop because of adverse reaction, and about same number of patients had to decrease the dose because of toxicity. Similarly, same thing, about 50% patient in Jacopi had to stop the drug because of adverse event. So looking at all this, this is a magic drug for me, and I would say this is a novel magic drug for patients who are difficult to treat with immunosuppressive therapy. So let, 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 let us share, let me share a few questions before concluding about the magic drug. And here we have uh, a few comments and several questions about the uh, exact activity and efficacy in some specific organs. Uh, so, and I, I personally am thinking, for instance, about the lung, which has been always a very difficult to treat localization of chronic GVHD. So we have a question about this, for instance, from Dr. Jessica Voss. Thank you for uh, contributing. So Alexander, what's your feeling? I mean, you know these data, you've been treating these patients. Where do you see this drug most active when it comes to organ uh, involvement? Well, um, I would probably just uh, make a little disclosure here. Uh, as uh, promising as uh, all these drugs uh, sound, in fact, you know, I should congratulate the community in general because you know a few years ago we didn't have any of the approved drugs, and we haven't gone beyond steroids, and now we've got the luxury of uh, comparing. So I, I would a little bit uh, warn everybody about the sort of direct comparisons. We ultimately need a prospective trial, right, that would compare these agents head to head because ultimately, as Bipin has rightfully mentioned, uh, these uh, trials have been targeting uh, unique patient populations. There's certainly a certain amount of selection bias to prohibit us to do any direct comparisons. But, uh, you know, just to look at the data the way they are, uh, I uh, should uh, say that, uh, as we outlined in the paper, the responses were observed uh, across all organ systems. And uh, uh, we're dealing here with the population um, of advanced uh, chronic graft resistance disease with three prior lines of therapy. And uh, certainly a, a, a good fraction of patients with sclerotic complications, bronchiolitis, obliterus syndrome. As probably some of the readers have noticed, uh, uh, all the responses uh, that we have seen uh, in general, you know, they were, they were partial responses, even though uh, complete responses were observed across all organ systems, except from the lungs, where a partial response was the best observed response. So certainly we know that, uh, you know, lung GVHD uh, uh, represents one of the major challenges and one of the biggest contributors to the GVHD associated mortality. So certainly, you know, seeing reversal uh, that would be complete uh, in that particular uh, uh, organ system would be, um, I believe, ambitious, but certainly um, I think the future work and possibly a combination of the agents and new agents coming in would be tackling that issue. But we have seen, as I said, complete responses across organ system, particularly in the patients with uh, uh, cutaneous sclerosis and with joint and fascia involvement. Uh, I've had a few of those patients in my clinic uh, you know, who had uh, restriction in the range of motion and uh, after getting on the drug, I mean, they certainly uh, had almost complete reconstitution and 100% uh, uh, reconstitution of the range of motion. We've seen patients, uh, you know, with cutaneous manifestations and alopecia uh, with the uh, uh, hair follicles regrowing. Uh, and in and, and those cases have been anecdotally certainly described and we're aware about those. So I would say certainly uh, th this is uh, uh, the type of the drug that is uh, specifically targeting fibrosis, but also has uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and that's what we believe has contributed to uh, the complete responses that were seen across uh, uh, most of the organ systems. On the other hand, just as Bipin has mentioned, uh, with ibrutinib, if you remember uh, the stipulations of the trial inclusion, um, we're calling for photographic erythematous rash. And so certainly, you know, the preponderance of the patient population uh, enrolled within that subset uh, was, was, was apparent. Uh, and, and certainly it's not always that we have erythematous uh, manifestations, right, in chronic GVHD. Uh, we can have lichen planus type of changes, we can have morphia, and, you know, certainly sclerotic changes that wouldn't even look erythematous at all, uh, but yet those patients would be severely debilitated uh, and certainly would have advanced disease. 
So here, uh, my role is to be fair and balanced, but I would like to uh, clearly highlight that in the second paragraph of your discussion in the paper, uh, you clearly highlighted that when it comes to lung chronic GVHD, you didn't see any complete remission, only PR. So Correct. the lungs remain a uh, very uh, difficult localization to treat. And actually we have uh, Dr. Patricia Mensa Glanowska, hopefully I'm pronouncing it well, who is sharing with us a very difficult situation of one of her patients uh, with uh, bronchiolitis, bronchiolitis obliterance. And we know that these are very difficult situations. So Bipin, uh, and we have a few questions about this. You are highlighting the safety, uh, the specific safety of this drug, no excessive infectious complications because we've seen in the past some effective drugs, but that can be achieved at the cost of uh, a high rate of uh, opportunistic infections. So here we have a question comment from uh, Dr. Walkstein, but also again from Dr. Voss, uh, that given the balance of safety and efficacy of this new drug, uh, where do you see it in the uh, treatment algorithm and where, whether you can see it uh, going into uh, earlier lines of treatment? Very, very important question. And I wish I thank you for asking this question. You know, like I mentioned before, the ability to stay on therapy is dependent on the safety and long-term tolerability profile of the intervention. And as we've seen in this study, duration, median duration of response, 35 weeks, more than almost one third of patients were on therapy beyond uh, 18 months. So now interesting part of this study, which is striking to me, overall response rate among patients with moderate non-severe GVHD was 83%, suggesting further study will be very effective if we try to this, this intervention early. So benefit, higher, almost close to 85% with minimal or no infectious major issue with no, no patient died from uh, infection in this study related to drug. So this is where I'm future is, early intervention with belumosal oil and we will get better response without increasing infectious complication. But when you say early intervention, is this going, for instance, about frontline treatment in combination with corticosteroids, for instance, because we've seen the release of recent results about, I think, uh, the so-called integrate trial reported at the last uh, EHA uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, showing some, I would say, maybe disappointing results when you combine uh, ibrutinib with corticosteroids frontline for chronic GVHD. Where, where are your thoughts here, no. Bipin? I, may, I mean that it may benefit patient earlier in their disease as indicated. Okay. No, no, we don't want to use, the, I don't know how much price will be. And I'm very concerned about cost, cost, cost effective management. Absolutely. Accessibility and cost effectiveness is something of concern to all of us. So Alexander, we have here a few questions and I think they are really irrelevant about the corticosteroid sparing effect of the drug. Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, even if you have a response with a given drug, but you're not able to decrease corticosteroids and you know, even discontinue them, maybe the side effects will continue to be there. So wh wh where do you, wh what, was the, uh, what were the results here? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, that's, uh, that's an absolutely important point. I'm glad that the audience has raised this issue up uh, because uh, um, uh, in our trial, we clearly see the reduction in mean corticosteroid dose in about 45% of the patients and as you're probably aware, the subsequent trial uh, that was presented last year's uh, ASH meeting by Dr. Cutler from Dana-Farber, that's uh, the Rockstar trial, uh, also confirmed um, the, this observation about 44-45% uh, of the patients uh, had uh, reduction uh, in their mean corticosteroid dose. And certainly, you know, a good fraction of patients uh, were able to completely come off the steroids. Um, we believe this is critically uh, important uh, because uh, uh, the number one reason for our chronic GVHD patient population uh, uh, 
suffering and having life-threatening complications, certainly from infections and certainly uh, being able to taper off uh, uh, you know, immunosuppression that would otherwise uh, place these patients at excessive risk for infections is certainly critical. Um, so from that standpoint, I think, uh, you know, melamozodil has a clear potential. Uh, similar data were reported, uh, of course, uh, you know, with uh, uh, ibrutinib. Uh, I believe the reported percent reduction there was about 65% uh, in the mean corticosteroid dose. Uh, and I believe with roxalutinib, we also have some data about 50% reduction uh, in some observational studies published from China by Wu et al. And I believe also by Mori et al. Uh, pretty much within that range. It certainly would be of interest uh, to, to see uh, uh, more detailed data uh, uh, kind of coming out from REACH3 clinical trial. But again, the distinct difference in between REACH3 and our studies is uh, that, you know, the prior lines of therapy limit in REACH3 was only one. So that's the failure to steroids, right? So it was really uh, kind of uh, tested in a second line setting. While here, we're really dealing with uh, advanced patients with chronic GVHD and in a 208 trial, we had three prior lines of therapy as a limit. Uh, in the Rockstar trial, the limit was five. But another major difference with the REACH3, please allow me. REACH3 is a randomized phase three randomized trial. Study. Correct. So, Correct. But, uh, but different setting. Here, yeah, that's, that's what I... Ab right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, Alexander, please stay with me because we have a few questions about the kinetics of response of the drug. How quickly did you see the responses? But we have also a few questions about uh, 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 whether you have seen uh, recurrence of chronic GVHD when you discontinue the drug. And one may wonder, why did you discontinue it? Because it is a, a safe and effective treatment. So any thoughts on these different scenarios? Yeah, so I think uh, the first question, um, uh, that you had was uh, uh, in regards to uh, how quickly did you the see kinetics. the response? Yeah, so most yes. of the responses actually were brisk, and they were observed within you know first four to eight weeks, uh, within the first two months after initiation of therapy. Uh, certainly, we had patients uh, uh, demonstrating uh, later responses, but most of the responses were pretty brisk, um, which I think is very important uh, and creates a big distinction in between uh, some other treatment modalities that we have. So, for example, with ECP, as you know. It takes uh, certainly longer time, you know, to expect on average, uh, you know, the responses to be observed. Um, so that's sort of one uh, feature uh, in terms of the kinetic of the drug. So if uh, the patients do respond, they respond uh, quickly. Uh, the second, I think, uh, boils down to. Um, uh, you know, the uh, secondary endpoint that was tested in a trial and uh, now is quite popularized is a failure free survival. And as everybody in this audience knows, uh, the failure free survival is a composite endpoint uh, of. Uh, certainly the relapse, uh, the non-relapse mortality, but also uh, for the patients transitioning to their next line of therapy. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, that uh, reason requiring next line of therapy, uh, which is mostly due to progression of chronic graft versus host disease, uh, was one of the major contributors uh, in this particular case. Um, so, you know, the drug does work, but if uh, uh, you, uh, paid attention to the failure-free survival curve, uh, certainly we had that outline that, that there was uh, certainly a substantial number of patients uh, who did progress and require transition to another line of therapy. Excellent. However, you, uh, just to kind of give a little bit of the perspective, uh, you know, the failure-free survival with CRPR, uh, we believe uh, that was uh, substantially higher than the established benchmark of about, you know, 15% range, uh, as uh, uh, we know from the uh, retrospective observational study by Paul Martin and all from Fred Hudge. And we believe that this uh, endpoint would be important to highlight uh, across a few other studies, uh, uh, since it's relatively uh, recent endpoint. Uh, not everybody is emphasizing this, but we believe that uh, certainly it would be nice to standardize uh, most of uh, these prospective studies uh, by these major uh, endpoints so that at least, uh, you know, we can have a better idea how they um, compare to each other. Excellent. Thank you very much. So clearly, we have the overall response rate. We have a good corticosteroid sparing effect. Uh, a very good rate of uh, uh, failure-free survival. But another uh, endpoint which uh, was very uh, positive, I think, uh, from my point of view in this study, and the investigators should be commended for performing this, was about the quality of life assessment, BIPIN. 
And we know that this is crucial because obviously you can improve all things, you know, in GVHD, but if uh, the quality of life of the patient remains bad, actually, uh, probably that's not a big achievement. And actually assessing quality of life is not an easy issue when it comes to a chronic GVHD. So how, uh, what was your interpretation of the quality of life assessment as part of this trial, Deepin? So, you know, so for the audience, you know, they assessed with, assess with the LSS, Lee Symptom Scale, actually. It is a, a well-being and a quality of life major combination of functioning, actually. And if you want to know, this article was published in Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplantation recently. A wonderful score. And, and more, I would say it's a, not because I like this article, but it gives us some accuracy, actually. You know, and you see in the clinic, you know, when you give treatment, you go documentation by NIH GVHD score, patient remains same, but patient feels better. And this is what this scale will capture. So with this drug, excellent measure, you know, those who are responding had an improvement in score, as well as those non-responder also had improvement in score. That gives us good information whether we can decrease the steroid or not. And that helped most patients. So those patients who were not responders, they also had a decrease in their steroid days in about 30% dose reduction compared to 50% dose reduction in uh, patients who were responding. So this is how, and it is very wonderful. I would say we should, we should apply to our clinic in almost all patients with chronic GVHD. So that will give idea about when to decrease the steroid despite not responding by NIH scale system. No, I think this is, this is an important message to uh, the whole transplant community that we really need to pay attention to this and maybe try uh, to modify uh, our practices. So, Alexander, we're almost reaching the end of this uh, journal club, and we know that uh, uh, belumozidil has been granted breakthrough uh, therapy designation by the US uh, FDA. So my question to you, because you're involved in this, what are the next steps? Yeah, so I think uh, um, th this is certainly an exciting time uh, because uh, if uh, uh, this uh, drug is granted approval, certainly our patients have an opportunity to potentially uh, benefit from its use, uh, uh, certainly in advanced setting. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, um, you know, there are a lot of plans uh, in place uh, to uh, you know, test this drug in certainly earlier settings, but also uh, you know, plan for the studies that uh, might be comparing uh, uh, this drug to the best available therapy just you know, in a way similar, uh, uh, similarly done in a REACH-3 uh, clinical trial, or perhaps even entertain you know, some head-to-head -head comparisons uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with other alternative options. Um, certainly those would be the next stages in development that we foresee. Excellent. Well, this has been really wonderful. Bipin, one last word, uh, take home message, some words of wisdom about chronic GVHD. You know, you know, I'm a late effect quality of life person. So I would like to have a treatment which gives minimal life, minimal late effect or complication. In our institution, if someone asks me, what is Bipin steroid favorite dose? 15 to 20 milligram. I never want to give more than 15 to 20 milligram because we know it's a detrimental. And we have to have something where we can use minimal steroid. And that's what we are going for now. Excellent. Well. With this, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, another exciting uh, journal club uh, brought to you by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. And by the way, all the uh, this journal club, but also all the uh, previous journal clubs, but also uh, all the uh, different activities of the IICH can be uh, viewed uh, freely and easily. Uh, on the ICH website. This is uh, clinical-hematology.org. And you can see our monthly webinars, the journal clubs, but also the new initiative about the ICH news, where every week 
uh, you would receive some podcasts about the latest advances in the field of hematology. So Dr. Savani, Dr. Lazarian, again, thank you so much. It has been a true pleasure. I'd like to thank our participants, the audience, for the really great questions. You've been several hundreds attending uh, tonight, this morning, this afternoon, wherever uh, you are. So thank you very much and see you uh, for another Journal Club in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, safe. Dr. Mori, for invitation. Thank you. Thank you. And keep Thank you. well. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.